and uncertainties in life, God offers to us more hope. We want to welcome you again to another exciting study in the Word of God. Today our focus is going to be on victorious living. How do we live victoriously for Jesus Christ day in and day out? Many people today are, are, are involved in physical exercise. Some are doing it for health reasons, others are doing it maybe because they're training for um, some competition or just to stay in shape or build up their, up their muscles. Well, the same way in which athletes and, and people in general exercise in order to be healthier, athletes train in order to be more competitive, in the Christian life, there has to be some training going on also. We're going to focus today on one text that, in particular, found in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 7, where Paul is admonishing his protege, Timothy, and telling him that he must train to be godly. We're going to dive into that study, but for just now, we're going to allow our your, your group leader to facilitate and, and to take you through a study, and we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. Just as an athlete trains for a competition, getting himself or herself ready to compete. They understand the necessity of training on a daily basis. Here in this chapter in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 7, Paul is not taking for granted his protege Timothy's godliness. He's admonishing him to train himself to be godly. Timothy had been with Paul for many years, and yet Paul was telling him, Timothy, you've got to train yourself to be godly. In other words, you've got to discipline yourself to become spiritually fit. Isn't that true for all of us? One of the things that an athlete understands is that there are certain principles to training, certain disciplines that he, must, he or she must uh, adhere to. Well, the same thing is very true for, for, the, for the Christian. The athlete knows that the first principle com, com involved in training is that he or she must take personal responsibility. They understand that nobody can do the training for them. They must put forth the effort. They must put in the work. They must pursue to be the best that they can. The Bible tells us in Philippians 2 and verse 12 that we ought to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. God is saying to us, we've got to pursue it. We've got to put forth the, the effort and be willing to know more about what God would have us to do. Isn't it interesting that we put forth that type of uh, effort in our business, in academics, whether we, if we're in school, even in our, in our ministries. But we tend to be a little lazy and indolent when it comes to exercising our own spiritual, in our own spiritual lives. It's easy to pray, God help me to be godly, and then expect him to pour out godliness on us. Well, it doesn't work that way, does it? No, there's something that, that we are to do if we are to be, become spiritually, spiritually fit. The second principle is the, object, uh, is the object of training, and that's to grow, to get better than, where, than what, we, what we are. And that takes commitment. Being willing to, on a daily basis, like the athlete, on a daily basis, getting him, or he or herself up, and putting in the work and the effort to become the best that they, that they can be. Jeremiah 29 and verse 13, the Lord admonishes us. Seek me with all of your heart. 
In Philippians 3 and verse 12, Paul is saying that I've got to press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of him. There is something that we are to do in order to become spiritually fit. Just like the athlete, it is necessary for us to train and be willing to put in the work and to train hard. Daily we must seek the Lord. Daily we must ask Him to give us the strength to be able to live in this life victoriously. That's our goal. Not only to live victoriously, but our goal is to grow in Jesus Christ. But we also need competent teacher or a coach. The successful athlete always has a coach, someone who is there to guide them, to tell them what they're doing right, even pointing out those things that they are doing wrong. I thank the Lord today that we have a coach. We have a competent teacher and his name is Jesus Christ because God will not allow us to be mediocre in our spiritual growth. He wants us to grow high, to go higher and higher in our spiritual development. And so he is there to guide and to teach us. And we're not talking, when we study God's word, we're not talking about just mere academic knowledge. No, no, we're, we're talking about being teachable so that the Holy Spirit can guide and direct us so that the things that we study in God's word will know how to apply in our daily lives. There's a third characteristic or a third principle that's involved in training. And that is the athlete, just like the athlete knows that in order to get better, he's got to practice, practice, practice. We are sinners. God has told us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The reason that we are labeled sinners is because we're good at it. We've been doing it so long. We've been practicing it so long that we've become good at it. Now Jesus wants to take us from being sinners to living righteously. And the word righteous simply means doing what is right. And the more we do it by the power of God's spirit, the better we will become. And we don't do it on our own. God is there to help us. There is no, there is no endeavor in life in which perfecting of that skill or endeavor does not require practice. Something that we do over and over and over again to get better at it. The more we pray, the more we study, read and study the word of God, the better we will become to be able to combat the things that are happening to us, the challenges that face us in this life. We'll get better and better at it because we know we are not doing it on our own. We have Jesus Christ, who is our anchor, who is our teacher, and who is our divine helper. But it's not going to be easy. Sometimes we believe that, that the things that we want to do, we find that we don't do. We intend to do right, but there's... But the Bible tells us in Romans, the seventh chapter, verses 15 through 25, that there's a war raging within us. Paul put it this way. I want to do good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And yet we find that constant battle raging within us. But then Paul says, who can deliver me from the body of this death? He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who gives us the victory. Now, I hope that you have something to write with, because I want you to write these down, because how do we use the word of God? Since we know that the word of God is what we need and uh, for our daily study, how do we use the word of God? Let me suggest five methods uh, for intaking the word of God. The first is hearing through teaching and preaching. You hear and you are instructed by the word of God through, through one of God's servants, preaching and hearing or, or preaching and teaching, and you're hearing these things. 
But if you stop there, then you only find yourself being spoon fed the word of God. Hearing through preaching and teaching is number one. But secondly, it also requires reading. What you hear through preaching and teaching is good, but we are admonished that we must read the word of God for ourselves. How often should we engage in that? We are admonished through the word of God that we must do it daily. Just like you eat and, and your body craves food, your spiritual, your spiritual self craves the word of God to take it in on a daily, on a daily basis. I would further suggest that in order to have an overview and a, a clear perspective of God's word, that you develop a, a Bible reading plan and purpose as your goal to read the Bible through in, in uh, each year and use different translations to do that. When you use different translations, you get a different perspective of what God is saying from from the various translations of, 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 the word, of the Word of God. So reading is essential. But there's a third principle, and that is study. Reading gives us breath, but study gives us depth. We are researching, and we're, we're not just reading just for words. We are studying the Word of God to know how now can I apply that to my own life. Each thing that we that we study, the deeper that we study it, we're saying, Lord, I'm doing this because I want your word to be hidden in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Psalms 119 and verse 11. God wants us to store the word of God in our hearts. And we have to do that on our own. No one can do that for us. You hear something through the preaching or teaching and you go back to the word of God to discover it for yourself. And all kinds of truths begin to come out and the word of God becomes alive to you and it becomes a part of you. And you find yourself going from from victory to victory in your living because challenges in this life are going to come. But we here we take a lesson from Jesus Christ. You remember when in, in Matthew 4, when Jesus was confronted by the devil after he had been fasting 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. And every time the devil came to him with something, Jesus was able to ward him off by saying it is written. Jesus had the word of God in his heart. And since Jesus is our perfect example, we need to follow that example and and digest, take in and digest the word of God so that it becomes a part of our of our daily of our daily living. The fourth principle in the use of you of utilizing God's word is memorization, not just reading and just studying, but actually memorizing texts of scripture from God's word. Thy word have I hid in my heart. David said that I might not sin against thee. Proverbs 2, 1 says, My son, store up my commands within you. God wants our storehouse to be full so that when we are confronted by the enemy, we have something to combat him with. The devil will flee from the man or the woman who has the word of God in his or her heart and can ward him off because surely he's going to throw all kinds of darts at us. His purpose is to defeat us. God wants us to succeed in our living for him. And so by memorizing the word of God, it becomes a part of who we are and it becomes natural when we're speaking. We can witness, we can tell others about the love of Jesus. And we, can, and we can share with them the words of Jesus Christ himself. That way we build strong faith. If you want strong faith, you've got to study the word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, 
Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So in order to have strong faith, we need a strong study habit in God's word. Start your day, each day, with prayer for understanding and then open God's word and let God speak to you through his word. The fifth way that we use the word of God is through meditation. This is taking time and being alone with God, literally talking to yourself about the scriptures that you have read. To understand them, turning them over and over in your mind and seeing how and, and seeing how you can apply those things to your life on a day to day basis. Training in godliness requires commitment. It requires ministry or the teaching of God's Holy Spirit. It requires practice on our part. When Paul said to Timothy, train yourself to be godly. He's saying to him, he was saying to him as he's saying to us today, discipline yourself for the purpose of becoming spiritually fit. We are living in a world that is full of turmoil, full of evil. I've said to many people, and I say it to, 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 to you today, my friends, that let's stop talking about our problems and, t and, and stop calling our, the things that challenge us, that confront us, and calling them problems, and just refer to them as challenges. They are only problems when we try to handle them ourselves. But they become challenges when we know that God is by our side and he's fighting the battle for us. You remember the story of David and Goliath when David in, in 1 Kings 18 was confronted by Goliath. And he was not afraid because he didn't see like his brothers. He didn't see Goliath as a problem like his brothers did. He saw Goliath only as a challenge. Because unlike his brothers, David understood and knew that God was with him, that God was going to fight that battle for him. And as a result, he won the victory. My dear friends, victory is ours because Jesus has promised that he'll give us the victory. But there, we must also do our part. Let us equip ourselves with the word of God. Let us train to be godly. Let us put in the effort. Let us put in the time to spend with God in prayer and in the study of his word. Let's memorize it and let's meditate on it and watch what God will do. God will give you victories in portions of your life that you never thought possible. I believe that with all my heart. And my prayer for you, and I pray that, and I hope that you will pray for me, that all of us will experience victory in Jesus as daily we train to be godly.